soon. Oh, well, for those of you who've never seen me speak, you'll soon find out that I'm a rambunctious and highly excitable uh, psychologist from the States. <laughs> and uh, I've come here halfway around the world just to be here with you today to share with you a big conclusion that I've drawn after more than a decade of deep thinking around systems theory, developmental psychology. Would you like to hear my conclusion? Yes. Yeah. yes. Good, because I was going to share it anyway. <laughs> Wait, let me get on the soapbox first. I strongly believe that the era of empathy is now upon us. In other words, empathy, the ability to see, feel, understand the world from the perspective of others that we meet, I believe will be the most important psychological skill that any of us in this room could possibly possess if we hope to both survive and thrive in the decades ahead. In fact, I feel quite strongly that without a global grassroots groundswell in empathy, and soon our Earth's human and natural systems will eventually collapse and we'll all be left holding the bag for centuries of unconscious human behavior. And now that I've cheered you up, <laughs> allow me to apologize. <laughs> I know this is a big topic and I, you know, I try to, you know, I know I've made a lot of awkward moments at dinner parties bringing it up and I've learned that you're supposed to make stuff fun. You know, and, and I tried to find a fun way to bring it up, but I just couldn't. Okay? I, was, I was searching, I was searching. But then a funny thing happened to me on my way to New Zealand. Okay? <laughs> I was in the airplane, and uh, you know, the airplane landed, and we're all getting up, taking our turn to go down the aisle. Uh, you know, row after row, bag after bag, everybody slowly moving, us behind them waiting patiently. And finally, I was in the back, and my row's turn finally arrived. So uh, I motioned the woman across for me like a gentleman to go first. She started to go, when all of a sudden, a guy in a business suit with a briefcase plowed through us and jetted down the aisle without even looking back. And I know this happens all the time. And normally, I wouldn't get so irritable, but for some reason, it really got under my skin. I mean, really. Would it really have been so hard just to wait a couple seconds to let her go first? Because I'm really going to put a, a cramp in his neck. You know? so, always a good Samaritan. I decided to approach him in the terminal. <laughs> I said, excuse me, sir, is, is, your, is your briefcase is it packed with enough ice? He looked at me kind of confused. I said, no, I was just concerned. Is your briefcase, is it packed with enough ice? Because, you know, the, I assume you must have a liver in there for a guy to transplant patient the way you just plow through us back there without even saying, excuse me. His, his eyes turned icy as his brain detected my sarcasm, and he offered me an obscene finger gesture, which I won't dare demonstrate here among such refined company. And I'll admit it. I mean, you know. I was furious. You know, on the way to baggage claim, my mind was racing with evil visions of all the terrible things that I wish for this man and for the future generations of briefcase carrying offspring and bear his name. What a jerk, you know? That's a problem with the world today. Guys like this, they just had a little bit more empathy. <laughs> and then I realized I found the start to my speech. <laughs> because, well, First of all, I realized I was a part of my own sick joke. I mean, here I am, a supposed empathy expert, right? Uh, showing absolutely no patience or empathy for a guy because he didn't show any patience or empathy, right? And, and let's face it, all of my noble attempts to educate this man through sarcasm and humor would do about as much to solve the problem of his lack of social consciousness as dumping gasoline would do to solve the problem of a raging house fire, you know? Um, now, right about now, I'm sure some of you are saying, wow, is that what the airport's like when you've studied too much psychology? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, it really is. So, well, at least for me, it is. <laughs> but, but still, there is a point here, so stick with me, okay? Because this airplane thing, it's just a metaphor. It, it's, it's a simple metaphor for the human condition. Think about it. This silly airport squabble happens all the time, all over the world, every single day, in one form or another. Anywhere there are people. It happens between parents and their children. It happens between people and evil organizations, organizations and people, between organizations fighting for market share and military regimes battling to control oil-rich territories of our globe. Right? So, so, so let's take a minute and, and really step back and look at this. You know, the, the, the scale is different, but the dynamic is the exact same. Right? Blame, self-righteousness, and a, a, a primal dance of mutually unconscious flame throwing. <laughs> the exact opposite of empathy. So let's just take a few minutes and, and look at this. You know, from a big picture systems perspective, oh, it's my big picture pedestal. For the big picture uh, perspective, how might all of this global non empathy really impact the way our world works? You know, the, uh, the, the, the frustrating gridlock of our political systems, the 
uh, excesses of our corporate systems, the seemingly permanent realities of famine, and famine, poverty, war, all these things that none of us want, but that continue to plague us nonetheless. I ask you, would they even be possible if not for a deeply ingrained culture that fosters this sort of blindness to others and, and blindness to self? Furthermore, what is the real cost of this blindness? Is it just something that causes us to get into embarrassing squabbles at airports and makes corporations and organizations move slowly? Or, or does it go deeper? Maybe you've seen this. This is a picture of the polar ice cap, uh, one taken last year, one taken uh, 30 years before. Uh, and people argue over the details, but it looks like it's shrunk maybe about 40% of its original size in, in the last 30 years or so, maybe less. You know, if and when this ice mass melts completely, it, it appears very likely there will be a, a catastrophic and permanent shift in the Earth's climate. Furthermore, about 97% of scientists, Earth scientists, believe that this uh, melting is caused by the collective behavior of, of us human beings. <sighs> so, is there some sinister madman up there with his finger poised over the CO2 button, hell-bent on destroying the planet and with us the entire human race? Who's to blame? The truth is, we're the madman, right? We've created this problem and we continue to create it every day. The thing that I've noticed is that, sadly, when some of us get up the gumption to admit this and then try to solve this problem, too often we find that you know, despite our passion, despite our conviction despite our scientific data, despite the you know, uh, great ideas we bring. Too often our, our, our words fall upon deaf, uh, disbelieving, or disinterested ears. So what are we going to do? Is more angry, judgmental ranting going to cause kind of grassroots momentum that's going to keep the world from going down the tubes? Probably not. But fortunately, <coughs> we do have empathy. In, my experience, having now worked with change makers from the U.S., hundreds and thousands of them here in New Zealand and around the world, is, is, is pretty simple. Empathy works. Railing doesn't work. Complaining doesn't really work. Denial doesn't work. Manipulation doesn't work. But empathy, empathy works. Let's face it. In this world, cynicism is everywhere. And the ability to take a truly great idea and make it actually happen requires a community of people with a shared vision who understand in their bones that their own individual fates are inextricably intertwined. And who have the insight, the vision to recognize that the seeming apathy, the indifference of others that they meet, it's not real. It's a mirage, a facade, a flimsy shell of undigested pain begging to be broken open so that the better angels of human nature beneath it can finally be released. Empathy is the antidote to cynicism and the source of practical human insight that each of us is going to need in the coming decades if we hope to achieve our personal goals and also make the world a more enjoyable place. All right, sign me up. I'm ready to go. Well, <laughs> that's a okay. fast. Because before we can re get really great at this empathy thing, we need to define our terms and understand in a more scientific and practical way what this empathy thing really is. For too long, empathy was seen as some touchy-feely term thrown around by people who are addicted to group hugs. And if you guys like group hugs, that's fine. I'm, not, you know, I'm all for it. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is really a hard-won skill, which is the ability to truly step into another's existential shoes and experience the world from their unique worldview lens, regardless of how much we disagree with their opinions, regardless of how much our own values and belief, uh, beliefs differ from theirs. And as great as this sounds, in theory and practice is kind of hard, because this kind of thinking requires a level of patience and tolerance that goes against the grain of, of, of thinking patterns designed in our reptilian <laughs> brains through thousands of years of human struggle and evolution. Uh, and in fact, to, to get a feel for the magnitude of this inner challenge that we're facing, I want to try something. It should be fun. If everybody would humor me, just close your eyes for a second. Take a deep breath. Now, I'd like you all to imagine that you are a human being in the year 200,000 BC. No telephones, no TEDx, no PowerPoint clickers that don't work <laughs> or do work. Just you, the wind, the animals, nature. 
Day and night passes, and your experience of the world is one of drives. The drive to eat, the drive to sleep, the drive to procreate. You live in the moment, always hunting and gathering in loose tribal bands, always going after fulfilling your basic animal needs. You can open your eyes if you want. Now let me ask you, in that world, how important of a survival skill would empathy, the ability to see the world from another person's point of view, really be? The truth is, it wouldn't have that much to hang on to, would it? Uh, it? Lacking a clear concept of self and other, lacking a clear concept of time, past, present, and future, or even the idea of personal mortality, the, the idea of empathy doesn't really have many roots. So, okay, let's fast forward now. Let's go to 160,000 years to, uh, I said use that picture. Uh, to 40,000 BC. Now you're living in a tightly knit tribal unit organized around rites and rituals passed down from the tribal elders. Right? Now you're quite aware of the immense and fearful power of death and, and, uh, and the power of nature. And you spend your life really sacrificing your own needs to try to help uh, protect and, and, and support the tribe. In this tribal world where you're living, how important would this skill of empathy, the way we're defining it, be relative to, say, gathering food and following tribal laws? Not the way I'm describing it, but we'll get to that, okay? See, obviously, empathy has been there at every stage, but what I'm talking about is a little bit different. And if we wanted to, we could go through every level. 8,000 BC, with the rise of huge dictatorial regimes. We could go forward to 3,000 BC, 2,000, with the rise of these huge monotheistic religions. Uh, we could even go forward then to the birth of science and the flourishing of education and the Industrial Revolution. And what we'd find if we stepped into the shoes of people from each of these eras, first of all, we would find that empathy was always there. We have mirror neurons and all this stuff that we love to talk about. But never, ever in the history of human thinking has empathy been a primary survival skill for the entire human race. Think about that until now. And this is the big number. And it keeps getting bigger every day. 6.8. 6.8 billion people living on planet Earth right now. Just to put that in perspective, let's look at how m most of these people came. They came really recently. Back in the 1960s, there were half, half, less than half, 3 billion. Back in 8,000 BC with the authoritarian regimes, a paltry 5 million alive on the whole planet. We're just getting started. Right? If present trends continue, we may have as many as 12 billion people here on Earth by 2050. 12 billion people, all these people, eating, sleeping, consuming, dancing, living, working, right? It, 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 as they are today, that's just not going to be possible. In fact, some people believe that we may have already outstripped our Earth's carrying capacity uh, with our current cons consumption patterns. Uh, meanwhile, in exploding economies like China and India, uh, the, the seductive mental comforts of unbridled consumerism are just now taking root, right? So when we start to look at this, we start to see why the era of empathy truly is upon us. We don't have any other choice. Right? Empathy, a luxury, and sometimes, honestly, even a burden in past eras, will be an absolute survival skill for the 21st century because without it, we're in trouble. In this densely populated global village with satellites screaming through space and bombs powerful enough to blow the Earth clear off its axis, empathy is going to be the only way we're going to stay in contact on a human level and thus keep from destroying ourselves and destroying our planet. We've got to work it out for us. According to some of the research that we've been doing at Worldview Learning, we're looking at the distribution of thinking styles across the U.S. and around the world. And, and what I can tell you with fair certainty is that about 80% of that 6.8 billion is still thinking from values and worldview lens beliefs that are more appropriate to earlier eras, the challenges of earlier eras of human thinking. Okay? And so the real question is, is almost to, to look at the math here and, and say, how are we oddly curious, empathy-prone, TED-loving people, this minority of 20%, going to inspire a groundswell of empathy, not only amongst ourselves, but also within the other, sometimes empathy-averse and survival thinking 80%. How is that going to happen? And with that question, we start to bump up against the limits of changing others, and we get to one of my favorite quotes of all time. Says, so you want to make the world a better place? Fix yourself, and there'll be one less scoundrel among us.
Let's, let's not get cocky. Hey, the science says that the way we're thinking may be at, at the upper echelon of the uh, evolutionary process right now. That's what the data says. But I don't think any of us have to look too far inside to find the burbling scraps of tribal explosiveness somewhere under <laughs> our skin. Like me at the airport. An empathy expert on his way to educate the world. <laughs> acting like a dictator from 8,000 BC at the slightest breach of propriety. So perhaps if we want to give empathy this global groundswell that it deserves. Maybe we've got to start with having empathy for ourselves, right? That little inner cave man, that little inner cave woman. Maybe we can just give them a big hug there. And, uh, and once we uh, you get that level of self-acceptance uh, and authenticity, then maybe we can start to build some authentic bridges of human understanding with the other briefcase carrying 80%. So let's get started, shall we? I look forward to joining you in embracing the global urgency of everyday empathy, one moment at a time, and I promise that I will continue my quest no later than tomorrow's cramped plane ride home. <laughs>